Hi, my camera runs out at the 30 minute mark and then begins another video and um, so that's why when I start getting like to 30 minutes I'm like I gotta shut this down now. So um, anyway we were talking about inspired, not inspired. So somebody else could come along that also was alive 20 years earlier and they may not be saying thus saith the Lord but they're going to tell you what was going on during that time from their perspective. Now, it may not be thus saith the Lord. It may not be inspired scripture to be written down. And you know what? Honestly, uh, I'm going to interrupt myself here real quick. You know, a lot of people, they will get upset about Apostle Paul. Some people say it was Peter that really should have had all the books in the New Testament and not so much Paul. Then you've got a lot of esoteric writings from Paul in the New Testament. And a lot of it, he was preaching or he was writing letters, okay? And this is con considered to be inspired word, okay? Reading the Pauline books. Well, it is my belief that if you have a man of God who is a pastor, who's pastoring a church... He should not be a hireling. He should not be somebody that went through some seminary. He was fed another man's interpretation. And then he gets a job that he's getting paid for. And he gets on the pulpit. And he's just regurgitating those selected things that he was taught in seminary or in college when he took his theology courses. You have to understand, we are in a wicked world and there are those that do not want certain informations giving out to the public, let alone your identity. Hello? You know who, what your identity is now. Your identity is that you were a fallen one and you ended up in a dimension you were never meant to be in. Okay? And because of the sin of Adam and Eve, we were pulled through a vortex. And uh, like I said... Jonathan Clark, he can explain the Vesica Pisces. Uh, he can explain why the sacred feminine is worshipped in this world. And if you don't believe me, I'll give you the biggest example. Well, who do you think they're worshipping there at the Vatican? Who do you think that the Catholic Church worships? They worship a woman. They're not worshipping God or Jesus Christ. They're worshipping Mary. But is it the Mary that we know of, uh, mother of Jesus Christ? Because Mary was not mother of God. I got news for you. She was not the queen of heaven. But if you find out and you research who the queen of heaven is, then you go back and you realize they're worshiping Eve. The people don't know it. And I'm not saying that Catholic people are bad people. But they're being systematically lied to as we are. So, getting back to what is hidden from us, you know, these pastors today, and this is my opinion, and I'm sure that there are many others that share my opinion on this. I feel that when a pastor is really being led by God, and he is preaching the word as it comes from God, and I believe there are some good pastors out there. There's a few. Uh, they're very hard to find, and they're not in my area. But I'm sure there's some obscure church out there that's not under the government in a 501c3 status. Another lesson for another time. But I'm sure there are some that are out there that really are giving forth the Word of God. I would consider that inspired. If they put those messages to paper, okay, this would be inspired word of God in today's time. What we have in our Bible, and people, you know, like I said, they're going to argue, oh, you know, Paul should have been the one, not, I mean, Peter should have been the one, not Paul, because Jesus said on this rock I will build my church. Okay, let me tell you, it was Paul's writings that got in here. These were inspired writings. Plus, he understood the esoteric because he was a Pharisaic Jew prior. Okay? These were inspired words by him. And he was 
pronouncing this to the public, he talked about the past, he talked about the present, and he talked about the future. Okay? Paul. Okay. A pastor today can be given visions by the Lord. He could talk about the past, he could talk about the current, and he could talk about the future. Now, we're going to look at the current real quick, and this is what I'm trying to explain, is that a pastor who is speaking, thus saith the Lord, that may have given, been given a word from the Lord, is giving you inspired word, okay? And he's saying things that he didn't sit there and decide he was going to say them. This is the Holy Spirit flowing through him, giving a message to the people for a reason. Okay? Now, let's say that this pastor is in our time. And he's talking about... Maybe he's talking about the Twin Towers and what happened during the Twin Towers that all these people would lose their lives and that, you know, let's say in his message he is saying that it was Satan that was behind this and, you know, and he's, he's pronouncing um, words as the Lord gives to him to the people, okay? Now, let's say I'm writing something, you know, I'm a not a philosopher, maybe I'm somebody that's a historian. And I decide that I'm putting books together. I was around when 9-11 happened. And from my perspective, you know, Satan caused that. And, and I know so much more now than I knew back when it happened. But I do a writing that also follows similar guidelines to what this pastor pronounced that he spoke by the Lord. Now, through my spiritual eyes, or maybe I don't have spiritual eyes, and I'm looking at that and I'm saying, you know, Satan was behind that. A lot of people died. And I start giving facts about 9-11, and I write them down. And then you go into the future, a thousand years, and somebody picks up what the pastor said and he says, wow, this is inspired word of God and puts it into a book and calls it scripture. And then they run across a text that I wrote on the same topic, but I'm not thus saith the Lord and I am not speaking from God's point of view. I'm speaking through my eyes how I saw it. Then this also means that this was an uninspired text, okay? But it doesn't mean that what I wrote was not true. It just means that these were not words that came from my mouth, that came straight from the Lord. And that is the comparison I'm making. When you look at these books, these are truth according to those who wrote them, okay? It's truth according to them, you know? Those that wrote it saw it. You know, and, and some of it was filled in from things that they heard from other people, you know, where they filled in the gaps. And you have to be discerning when you read these books. Obviously, you can't sit here and read the Book of Jubilees and read a totally different story before it got to Noah and say that's the truth. Because now I'm looking at the Bible that's inspired scripture and that one little piece wasn't lining up. But then the part about Noah fit right in. And what was going on during the days of Noah. This may be uninspired, but it doesn't mean it's not truth. And that's the point that I'm making. So when you have pastors out there that are saying, don't you dare read those extra books. It's only going to cause you confusion. They're not true. They are not inspired. They're just telling you that they're not inspired as is a sermon coming from the mouth of a pastor as being inspired by God. Just means that somebody else saw it at that time and they wrote about it according to how they understood it. Okay? So that's the point that I wanted to get across about inspired and non-inspired. Now, according to those in the know that didn't want you to read Book of Enoch or all these other texts, that were once a part of our original canon. They were removed and 
the people were told they were uninspired or non-inspired. Okay? Who cares? Who cares? And you know what? Reading some of them, they are inspired. Okay? It may not have been um, Ezekiel talking. It may not have been Zechariah talking. It may not have been Hosea talking. But nonetheless, the, some of those were inspired works. Others of those um, were somebody's opinion at the time as how they saw things and how they understood it. So I'm not going to go through this loop again <laughs> and explain it. But I hope you understand the difference between inspired and non-inspired. So now with that, let's go back to, Mo to Noah. Okay. We already know that there was wickedness on the earth. We've already talked about how the Lord made a blueprint that um, Noah was to make this ark and um, he followed the Lord's instruction. Okay, so then we get into it. Now we're taught, I guess children, I don't know if they even teach them anything in Sunday schools anymore. I really don't. I mean, <laughs> the last church that I attended... Uh, they weren't really learning anything like that. So now you hear, have an ark and animals are coming on it. And we've been taught in Sunday school, there's even a little song, you know, about how in came the animals two by two. Okay. Let's see what the Bible says. Chapter 7, verse 2. Of every clean beast thou shalt take to thee by sevens. Whoa! We never heard nothing about sevens before. This is the Bible, okay? This is the inspired word. The male and his female, and of the beasts that are not clean, by two, the male and female. So two by two are the beasts that are not clean, but the clean beasts, are being taken in sevens. Do you know that every number throughout the Bible has some kind of significance? And you see them repeated. The Lord has his own um, numerology of sorts. He really does. Now, are these to be used for occult purposes? Um, heaven forbid. <laughs> okay, but God does have his own numbering. You also see the occult, they have their own numerology going on too, but they are using it for a totally different purpose. Verse 3, of fowls also of the air by sevens, the male and the female, to keep seed alive upon the face of all the earth. Seed, offspring. For yet seven days, and I will cause it to rain upon the earth forty days and forty nights, and every living substance that I have made will I destroy from off the face of the earth. He's destroying the inhabitants. He is not destroying the planet. Okay, that's important to understand here. Because as we said in the beginning of these videos, that Genesis 1 and Genesis 2 is talking about a period of time where the earth stayed underwater and had to be recreated, which we referenced over to Jeremiah 4, 23 through 27. Okay. Verse 5, And Noah did according unto all that the Lord commanded him. And Noah was 600 years old when the flood of the waters was upon the earth. 600 years old. I wonder if they look 600 years old. I gotta wonder. Because uh, if he was like 400 and he got married, you know, I picture like, <laughs> I picture like a real shriveled up guy from a third world country um, in some of the uh, videos where they're asking you to donate. Um, but maybe not, you know? I mean, we've been... You know, through the generations, we have, some people will tell you we look younger. You know, you've heard it. 40 is the new 30. 50 is the new 40. Well, mm, I think these people looked better back then. They didn't have the pollution. 
didn't have the things going on that affect how we look and our aging and they lived longer so I think um, when God declared that he was going to make a man's life 130 years I think something accelerated within mankind I don't think that a 600 year old like Noah here looked like you know even a hundred year old that we look at now so verse 7 and Noah went in and his sons and his wife and his sons wives with him into the ark because of the waters of the flood of clean beasts and of beasts that are not clean and of fowls and of everything that creepeth upon the earth there went in two and two unto Noah into the ark the male and the female as God had commanded Noah and it came to pass after seven days that the waters of the flood were upon the earth and in the six hundredth year of Noah's life in the second month the seventeenth day of the month wow very specific here the same they were all the fountains of the great deep broken up and the windows of heaven were opened and the rain was upon the earth 40 days and 40 nights so Noah was in that ark a whole lot longer than 40 days and 40 nights but it continued to rain 40 days and 40 nights um, also I want to talk about specifics in the Bible you know all of our calendars have been changed um, there was a calendar in the very beginning um, there was a Jewish calendar and the Jewish calendar of today is not the Jewish calendar before everything has been changed everything has been meddled with messed up made imperfect okay God had his own calendar in fact here's a little known um, a, a little known thing that most people have never considered even the Sabbath didn't fall the same day of the week every week okay it went according to the phases of the moon the Sabbath could land on any day of the week but it was like I said according to the moon phase today it is from Friday evening until Saturday evening is considered Sabbath and the reason why it starts on Friday evening goes back and we'll, we're going to be making references back there but it goes back to the sixth day or the seventh day creation it's the sixth day creation where evening then morning is the first day evening then morning is the second day so the day begins in the evening and it ends at the end of the day the following day that is a considered a biblical day and the Jews still observe it that way um, why does it begin the night before has anybody ever thought of that why would it begin on the evening and then end during the daytime well when we came into this world we were darkness we were born into sin we have sinful natures and we sinned before we even got here okay so when we came into this world we are darkness and then it is through our lifetime that we come to the light Jesus Christ so we go from darkness to light as was creation in Genesis 1 going from darkness to light okay so when I look at this what I'm telling you is that even the months of our year they're all named after Greek gods and I'm gonna have to take the time to lay this out for you you know we have January February okay these were named these were named after different popes okay you got August Augustus okay you've got July Julian and there was a reason why they meddled with the days of the month because they wanted to add extra day onto their month because it these people they really thought they were so important and they changed things okay then when you get to not only the months of the year but the days of the week you got Saturday Saturn you know you got they're named after pagan deities so our whole calendar has been changed so when you go through the Bible it'll refer to the month of Nisan okay these were the Hebrew names that were given for these particular months 
Everything has changed since then, and it's been by the hand of mankind. Ultimately, the root of it is Satan. He's had these things done because this world is here to glorify him. Okay? It's his planet. It's his world. This is his habitation. So he changed things and he tweaked them to suit him. And the days of the week and the months of the year all fall into that category, including how many days are in a month. Everything's been changed on you. You know, two days were stolen from the month of February, which is why you only have 28 days. And then every four years you get a leap year. All of this, all this was done intentionally, okay, in after, after the time of Jesus, his death. Um, all of this being changed through the Catholic Church. Okay? So, moving on. It talks about, you know, verse 14, they and every beast after his kind, the cattle after their kind. Uh, they went in, verse 15, they went in unto Noah and the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. So they came in two and two, but of the clean beasts, there were more than two. There were seven. And they went in, and they went in, yeah, male and female, as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut him in. The Lord is the one that shut the door to the ark. It wasn't Noah, it wasn't just him taking, you know, this, this wooden plank and shoving it into the jam of the door. God shut it. Nobody else was getting into this ark. Okay? And the flood was forty days upon the earth, and the waters increased, and bare up the ark, and it was lift up above the earth. It's going up. And the waters prevailed, and were increased gently upon the earth, and the ark went upon the face of the waters. And it gets into, um, it says that fifteen cubits upward did the water prevail, and the mountains were covered. This was deep. Anything that was on this planet, I don't care if it was a 30-foot giant, it was going to get taken out in this flood. Okay? And when you go down to verse 21, And all flesh died that moved upon the earth, both of fowl, fowl are birds, and of cattle, and of beasts, and of every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, and every man. All in whose nostrils was the breath of life of all that was in the dry land died. Okay, so it's talking, it just continues on talking about the destruction. And then when you get into chapter 8, it begins talking about, you know, kind of remembers Noah. I don't, it doesn't mean it like, you know, he forgot all about Noah out there and then he just decides to remember him. That's not the context of that word. That word just means that God considered Noah. That's what the word um, remembered means. Chapter 8, and God remembered Noah. God considered Noah and every living thing and all the cattle that was with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth and the waters as assuaged okay the fountains also of the deep and the windows of heaven were stopped and the rain from heaven was restrained so here we go it is now done there's no more rain going upon the earth and now the waters are starting to recede so that noah and his family could go back to living on the earth and I gotta wonder, you know, being in an ark with all these animals, it had to smell. There had to be a lot going on. Plus, feeding all of these animals had to be a lot of work. And it had to be the power of God over these animals just to keep them in line, you know. Some of these animals, even today, are so diametrically opposed to each other that one sees the other as part of its food chain. So had to be a lot of work okay and it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made and he sent forth a raven which went forth to and fro until the waters were dried up from off the earth then he sends out a dove verse 8 
uh, to see if the waters were abated from off the face of the ground. But the dove found no rest for the sole of her foot, and she returned to him in the ark. Okay, so the water is receding, but it's not going to happen in a day. You know, it takes time for these waters to die down and, and for the dry earth to appear again. Okay? It's, got, it's saturated this planet. Okay, and he stayed yet, talking about the dove, verse 10, and he stayed yet other seven days. Okay, now Noah. And again, he sent forth the dove out of the ark, and the dove came to him in the evening, and lo, in her mouth was an olive leaf plucked off. So here we are, we're getting closer to dry ground, we got an olive leaf. Okay? And he stayed yet another seven days, and sent forth the dove, which returned not again unto him any more. And it came to pass in the six hundredth and first year, in the first month of the first day of the month, the waters were dried off from the earth, and Noah removed the covering of the ark, and looked, and behold, the face of the ground was dry. Okay, so now, here he is, you know, the ground's dry. They're able to leave the ark. Boy, is this specific. And in the second month, on the seventh and twentieth day of the month, was the earth dried, and God spake unto Noah, saying, Go forth of the ark, thou and thy wife, and thy sons, and thy sons' wives with thee. Bring forth with thee every living thing that is with thee, of all flesh, both of fowl and cattle, and every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth, that they may breed abundantly in the earth, and be fruitful and multiply upon the earth. Okay? Verse 18, And Noah went forth, and his sons, and his wife, and his sons' wives with him. Every beast, every creeping thing, every fowl, and whatsoever creepeth upon the earth after their kind, went forth out of the ark. And Noah built an altar unto the Lord, and took of every clean beast, and of every clean fowl, and offered burnt offerings on the altar. And the Lord smelled a sweet savor, and the Lord said in his heart, I will not again curse the ground any more for man's sake. For the imagination of man's heart is evil from his youth, neither will I again smite any more everything living as I have done. As I have done. This is with the water. He's saying in the manner that he did it. Okay? Because the earth is going to be destroyed again, and it's going to be destroyed by fire, not by water. But this is the last time it's going to be destroyed by water, was the time of Noah's Ark. While the earth remaineth, seed time and harvest, and cold and heat, and summer and winter, and day and night, shall not cease. And God blessed Noah and his sons, chapter 9, and said unto them, Be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. So here we go again, replenish the earth. And for fear of you and dread shall be upon every beast of the earth and every fall of the air. Okay, so now they are now off the ark and they are now, they give this sacrifice and now they're going to begin their lives um, on the earth. And so I'm going to bring this session to a close for the sake of time. And then when we come back, we're going to talk about Noah's sons. So um, with that, I'm going to tell you, be blessed.